Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Today, we will talk with former hedge fund manager, Hugh Hendry. Nobody sees the world like Hugh. Listen in, you'll love it. In the mailbag today, inflation, gold, Russia, and life lessons. Remember, you can call our listener feedback line, 800 381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my opening rant this week, okay, just a few last thoughts about Elon Musk and Twitter and Tesla and what it all means. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. Why do I keep talking about this? Well, it goes back to something that I told you many episodes ago. I've said it once or twice. I feel like at this point in my life and in my career, it's um, it's my duty, it's my mission to help investors prepare for you know what I believe will be a rather dramatic and painful end to the longest bull market in history and certainly the most expensive bull market in history. We've never seen valuations like this, not in 2000, not in 2008, certainly, and not in 1929, just not ever. So I feel like it's my job to kind of underscore how extreme things things got at the top, and we're still very close to the top, um, and to help investors get through it. So I'm constantly pointing, not necessarily to specific metrics, although, yeah, you know, I I cite as many numbers as any financial guy, I guess. But I want to tell the stories and I want to tell listeners and readers of our newsletters what it feels like. I want to remind you, if you've been through this stuff before, what it felt like and, and that's what it feels like right now. So what does it feel like? to be at the end of a long bull market? What kinds of things happen? Well, I'll tell you one of the things that happens. um, Extremely, people who have really benefited from the bull run, extremely successful people by that definition, um, they get really super rich and they do things with money that, or they tend, they don't always, they tend to do things with money that are just a little too risky and they wind up blowing themselves up. And the classic mistake, of course, is to take on leverage. And there are various characters throughout history. Uh, we'll talk with one or two of about one or two of them with Hugh Hendry. But, you know, I'll mention Ike Batista, the Brazilian billionaire who blew up a bunch of commodity related businesses. Um, there's Aubrey McClendon, the guy who, uh, ran Chesapeake energy. He, he took on a lot of personal leverage. That's a facet of this too. Ike Batista took on personal leverage, billions of personal debt. Uh, and McClendon took on margin loans to buy Chesapeake stock. And that didn't work out well for him at all. Um, and, and Batista's in prison. McClendon died in a car accident that sure looks like suicide. And, uh, you know, others, there, there, there are many others that we could cite. Um, and I'm afraid that Elon Musk has, has fallen into this. We talked about this before, you know, he's, he took on a 12 and a half billion dollar margin loan to assist him in acquiring Twitter. And I'm just afraid that this is, you know, it's sort of another sign of the top, simply put, it's the type of thing you can count on happening. Because it's very hard. You know, Elon Musk is a brilliant guy, but he's just a human being. And I can't imagine what it's like to be the richest man in the world worth, you know, some $250 billion, according to uh, Bloomberg Billionaires Index. I, 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 you know, you can't imagine what it feels like. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's kind of an unnatural state of affairs for any human being. So he goes and buys Twitter and takes on twelve and a half billion of personal debt, and he levers up the company too. They'll have, I think Twitter has about five billion now. It'll have about eighteen billion or seventeen or eighteen billion after the deal is done. 
So, you know, there's leverage everywhere in this deal. And, and, you know, Musk has said, oh, this isn't about making money. It's, you know, I don't care about the economics of the business. It's about free speech. And so it's this very idealistic, highly levered, personally levered bet that is the typical thing that takes one of these guys apart. And I wish him well. I don't wish him ill, but I'm just telling you as an investor, we've seen it before and it never ends well. So there is that. Um, and there's also like, we just had this horrendous April, worst month of, of, you know, any month of the year, worst month in the NASDAQ since 2008, to, you know, the financial crisis, the depths of the financial crisis. And I'm afraid that, I'm afraid that this really, we may be in a bear market here. You'll never hear me, you know, say that we definitely are because I want to stress, one of the things I want to stress to you in handling this is that you won't know for sure that you're in a sustained downturn until it's maybe half over. If it's a two and a half year bear market, you know, it'll be, it'll be a year or a year and a half, something like that until you go, oh yeah, this is the end. It's we're you know, we're not going to, we're not going to think that 50 times sales is, or 70 times sales is a normal valuation for a SaaS company, software as a service. They, they, these are these software companies that got horrendously overvalued. And we're going to learn, you know, one more time that how these things play out, like all the garbage got murdered, you know, all the, the bubbles, the, you know, the ARC innovation fund is down almost 70%. And I have to give myself a little pat on the back. I'm sorry. I'm only human too. I wrote about that fund February 11th, 2021 in the Stansbury Digest. It peaked the next day and is down 70, almost 70%. And lots of NASDAQ stocks are down 75% or more. Um, and what's happening now, I believe, is that as, as this Wall Street saying goes, they're shooting the generals. Netflix, bam, Facebook, bam, you know, and even, even, um, Amazon is down quite significantly and dropped a lot in one day recently, you know, bam, Apple a little bit, not so much. And, and it's when they start shooting the generals that, you know, things, things could be getting really bad because see what happens in portfolios is you, you say you have some really high quality stuff like Apple or Amazon. Or, you know, let's just include Facebook and Netflix in that just for the heck of it, even though I think Netflix isn't the high quality everyone thought it was. Um, and so you hold on to those. You believe in those. You say, oh, I'll never sell these. These are my solid stock. And then you have all this speculative stuff. And the speculative stuff falls 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. You go, ah, and you sell it all out, right? And then what's left are these higher quality names. And you're like, hey, I'm solid here. They're down 20, 30%, but I'm good. And then they start falling and you sell them too, right? It just, it's, it's a, a pile on effect. You know, the selling just, just uh, spirals out of control. And I believe that we may have entered the, the shooting the generals phase of this where um, instead of it just being a washout of all the garbagey stuff, we're, we're entering into a time of, you know, genuinely, this is, this is when bear markets really, really get going because nothing is safe, right? Nothing is safe. So I think I'm going to leave you there, right? Musk personal leverage and leverage in Twitter is something we've seen before. It, it frequently doesn't end well. And, and this, uh, you know, Twitter is a, pretty big company, but it's not one of these high quality names. It's not like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Netflix, and the high quality names have sold off and, and are still kind of selling off. And that may be the beginning of the end. I don't know. But if it is, this is the thing that I've been telling you to prepare. Don't predict, right? Hold plenty of cash, hold your gold and silver, um, you know, do do those basic preparations. And, you know, when you find, you'll always, 
you know, it's always a good idea when you find a very good business with good upside potential and minimal downside potential. It doesn't matter what's happening in the overall market. You know, you should consider seriously consider adding it to your portfolio. All right. So I'll leave you there. Prepare, don't predict. I think this is it, man. I think it's underway. Um, so, you know, I, I hope you are prepared for what may be about to happen. All right. Now we're going to talk with Hugh Hendry. And listen, I, I talked with Hugh, actually, and, and he agreed. He said, you know, sometimes I'm kind of hard to follow, and we know that too. But I want you to give him a chance. Get out a paper and pencil or, you know, get, get open Microsoft Word or whatever you do to take notes and just follow along and take some notes. He goes off on a tangent here and there, but he always tends to tie it back together. Okay. I got a, last time Hugh was on the show, I got an email or two said, I can't follow this guy. This was rambling. It was crazy. It's not crazy. No one sees the world like Hugh Hendry. No one expresses themselves like Hugh Hendry. And I'll do my best to help along the way to make, to show you why it's so valuable to listen to a guy like this and to try to interpret his, his commentary. Okay. I love Hugh. I really want you to listen to this. Okay. Take notes, listen close, have fun. He's the funnest guy in the world. Let's do it. Let's talk with Hugh Hendry right now. Gold just passed $2,000 an ounce, setting the stage for a historic new bull run. Multiple billionaire investors are loading up on gold, including hedge fund founder Ray Dalio and real estate mogul Sam Zell, meaning now is the time to own gold. One precious metals expert is stepping forward with a big prediction. He believes we could see gold reach as high as $3,000 by the end of the year, possibly higher. Find out why and get instant access to his number one gold investment for 2022. It's not bullion, an ETF, or a mining stock. In the past, folks using this same gold strategy could have been able to make nearly 50 times their initial investment. Considering how quickly the price of gold has been moving, you don't want to waste any time missing out on the gains he believes are in store for this investment. To get a copy of his new free report with all the details, simply go to www.goldmania2022.com. Again, that's www.goldmania2022.com for a free copy of his new report. So with that, Hugh Hendry, welcome back to the show. Always a delight to just be able to kind of riff with some, you know, some uh, enthusiastic and, and smart people. So. so we didn't have any enthusiastic and smart people, but we have me. Um, <laughs> so there's no way that I can start with anything but like Musk buying Twitter. And I had this thought and I thought Hugh is the guy to ask this question to. Like, I don't think we'd be talking about this without living in the era of the hyper accommodative Fed because Tesla's valuation makes this transaction work, right? So Tesla gets a trillion dollar valuation. Mm. Elon Musk is, can buy Twitter and and, but I wonder, would we even be talking about Musk as much as we are if we did not live in the, the era of, you know, going on three decades of pretty, pretty accommodative Federal Reserve policy? Well, I'm sure the Federal Reserve is going to be with us in this conversation back and forward, because I think um, it's, it's clearly a, a trace element in the financial universe. And we can see it. Um, the interpretation of what we see, perhaps, is not uniform. Um, and I hope I have slightly more deviant uh, slants on it. So with regard to Musk, I'm always hesitant to kind of comment on Elon. He, he's just the, the master communicator. I mean, what he's, what he's achieved, both in terms of, you know, the, the technology package, you know, the, the car product, which isn't a car product, you know, it just seems to be like a, a revolution. You know, it's, you know, it's like Steve Jobs with, with the iPhone. You know, it's just completely reinvented um, this ubiquitous and common item. And I think that goes a long way to explaining things. Um, but the hesitancy is that there are much smarter minds than my own, which um, have never really taken to Elon and, and regard uh, 
a lot of his efforts as promotional. And my goodness, the financial graveyard is full of really, really smart guys who, who just have fought uh, the rise and rise of uh, Tesla to a trillion dollar company. Now, I want to bookend all that again with the Fed, um, because here we are, a, we're close to May 2022, and and some kind of little things are, are unraveling. So we had this um, exceptional experience for the world. We had a what I like to refer to as an alien body invasion, you know, the the virus. That was a profound shock, and it led to uh, one of the most immediate, sharpest downturns in the global economy, like ever. And markets in their appraisal of risk, the the first, if you will, the North Star was the risk-free rate, the US uh, 10-year treasury bond. And it came all the way down to just under 50 basis points. Um, As people said, hey, in in this, I mean, we're blindsided. We didn't see this thing. We we already had concerns about this long, long economic recovery, which when I say recovery, I'm still referencing 2008 because we've never regained the kind of altitude or the cadence of economic growth. We were on a projectile the 20, 30 years leading up to 2008, and we've never retained the surface, if you will, of of that projectile in terms of economic growth. So I guess there's already heightened kind of risk aversion uh, within the greater church of the financial community. Um, the, The virus was, was kind of the final straw. And so with regard to their equity selection, they said, hey, listen, find me risk-free equities. And that's a tad absurd. So it's all relative. Find me the relatively the most secure, commercially the most robust um, equities in the world. And that's what, that's what I'm going to own. And that's not an impossible task because against that profound and sudden economic weakness, um, Great, strong businesses revealed themselves, and they revealed themselves in the robustness of their P&L. Like there were businesses where profits were flat. There were businesses where revenues expanded and profits expanded. And so the the, the, the great church of, of, of financial investors came in and they went, boom, okay, I'm going to own Apple. And Apple like tacked on a trillion dollars in, in equity valuation. And it's like, okay, what else? Alphabet, boom, I'm going to take that. Now, what else? Facebook. Boom, I'm going to take that. Um, People staying at home, Netflix, boom, you you can see where this is going. Boom, I'm going to take that. Tesla, you know, know, this is a risk-free, it's not a risk-free operation, but at this point, it's a risk-free narrative. Boom, I'm going to take that. Tesla becomes a trillion dollars. So you can can see where I'm going with this. This year, um, we've actually had markets kind of reappraising as as more data points have emerged. Netflix is not a risk-free business as they've as they've coughed up. Facebook is not a risk-free business as they've coughed up. And so the, the danger with Elon's um, is it bodacious? I mean, whatever he's doing with, with Twitter, you know, he's decided to to spend some of his wealth. Good on you, sort of thing. But it's coming at a point where you know all the all the the, the divots or whatever are coming out of the ship, and we're like, oh my, oh my God! So like to have, and again the 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 assurity and the bank saying the, there was a comment. I mean, these are signs that there was a comment by a banker. What could possibly go wrong? It's like, oh, I'm copying that. I'm pasting that for posterity. I, I wish him well. I'm sure nothing will go wrong. But heavens, you know, there was a feast of, of the vanities, if you will, with regard to Twitter and Tesla. It's like he wants to tank the whole thing. And yeah, you know, we're at the point now where even Apple and Amazon, as you and I speak, have reported. And I mean, I, I got this feeling of it's over today. I'm like minus 1.4 GDP, Netflix, Apple, Amazon. Uh, you know, Jim Cramer wants to be long ETH. I mean, you know, it's just all going to hell, right? This is the moment. This is the risk off moment is we thought it was the the first, you know, couple of months of the year. But maybe that was like, you know, that was the overture. That wasn't the opera. <laughs> the opera has begun. <laughs> Yeah, and it's Germanic in that there's going to be many damn chapters. It's going to be really long, but it's going to be entertaining. You know, we're, we're, comfort- we're comfortable clothing, and uh, we're going to be here. Um, what's so interesting just now, like, um, there, there's a, 
it's been incredibly rewarding for this hedge fund model where um, you are incentivized to take, you know, like where volatility is on your side. Um, you know, you go concentrated, go leveraged, and you might make you might make a billion dollars PA. If it doesn't work, you might you, you might find a job like as a horticulturalist. I mean, that kind of sounds fun, you know. Like you know, you're you're working outdoors, plants is entertaining. Uh, who wouldn't take that bet? You know, and I think actually, I think the the really revealing thing is Bill Huang, crazy Bill, uh, in that he's at. He's, he's actually very revelatory with regard to, he's actually exposing what everyone does, right? Well, I mean, he was just gaming it, you know? He, they were giving, the, all the banks were like, 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 you know, your ears closed, how much you want? Fine, we're in, okay, right? And, and he went concentrated, he went leveraged. You, we saw, I mean, this week, the, the, we're drawing to the, the close of a week, but the, the week began. I wasn't expecting a black Monday, but I was expecting a kind of perilously weak Monday because the week preceding it, you know, we, we'd seen a number of like new laws emerging in important indices, equity indices. We'd still seen, you know, the, the treasury bonds just still being, you know, in intensive care. And then the big one was, you know, we saw a 3%, I'm not going to call it a devaluation, but we saw a 3% uh, pop lower in the value of the Chinese renminbi. And that's always been like a really, really kind of get out of the water signal. And so markets last Friday reacted. And then Friday, uh, sorry, Monday, um, you Hmm. And you know, back when I was managing money, there was this preposterous notion of the, the plunge protection squad. There was this you know, really silly idea that the Treasury and the Fed, yeah, do you remember that? Like, you know, the, somehow they, like, if older members might remember the A team, Mr. T, and like, so you had this crack SWAT squad driving around Manhattan in the early hours of the morning. Um, with you know, a band full of technology of trading screens, and when when traders were asleep in the, in the wee small hours of the night, when there's not much liquidity in the spoos, these guys would come in and they would go large and leave a huge footprint. And so traders would wake up the next morning, they go to bed, and their game plan was, man, I've got to reduce gross exposure here. This market's looking bad, and and actually because of the the goon squad and and the big futures move, you'd find actually um, you did nothing, you know, but if that is not the plunge protection squad. The plunge protection squad is not a public entity. It's a private entity. Um, and Bill revealed that, you know, what do you to protect your cherished concentrated portfolio of names? You then come in with these invisible anonymous contract for difference swap, um, equity swaps, and you just, you, you know, the, the one thing you've got to do today as a modern financial operator is avoid a lower tick. The next tick has to be higher because lower ticks reveal the truth and you don't want anyone to see the truth because you'd be naughty. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, and I, I was amazed by, as I read through the complaint against Bill Wong and his, his uh, cohorts at Archegos, I was amazed. I started counting the paragraphs of what they call misrepresentations, basically the lies he told to keep the financing coming. And I stopped counting the paragraphs at like 50. There's like 50 paragraphs of lies that he told to keep. And I'm like, let's think about the other side of this. Did you not know you were being lied to? I mean, come on. It's ridiculous. You know, you got to make your quarter. You got to get to the end of the quarter and, you know, you got to get your bonus. And of course, of course, whatever you say, Bill, you got it, buddy. It's ridiculous. Absolutely. But, you know, it's like, you know, I've got three kids and, and when they're, you know, when they're in that puberty stage and, and they're kind of still, the wires are still, fusing together you they all go through that lie test and and they always i mean i, I they all get it wrong you're right they, 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 all, they all the default is to lie hey who did this not me and and they're the worst liars you're like i'm gonna ask this again i mean like because you know the 
the consequences for not just this, but for lying on this are really severe, more severe than just coughing up. I'm like, no, nope, wasn't me. Oh, Jesus. I mean, that's- we were talking before, of course, and I said, uh, as soon as I found out, uh, and and Wong feeds into this. As soon as I found out that you know Musk was was taking out a twelve and a half billion dollar margin loan um, to finance Twitter, and and you know now that Wong has come to light, I'm like getting you know I got whiffs of Ike Batista, I got a whiff of Aubrey McClendon, you know the guy from Chesapeake who his he was indicted and looks like he killed himself the next day, but I guess we'll never know. Uh, um, and and I just, I wonder about, uh, and then I found out, I didn't know that, that Bill Wong was Kathy Wood's mentor and that these people knew each other and they're part of like a financial prayer group or something. And, um, and I just thought, uh, yeah, yeah, right. He's seated Ark, right. And I don't know, man. I, I, Elon seems like a different sort of guy. He really does. He doesn't. He doesn't look like Aubrey McClendon or Ike Batista or or or, you know, Batista bribed the governor of Rio. He doesn't. Yeah. Well, they're they're all different. Yeah. But they're all they're all different. I mean, you know, you know, they're really. I mean, you know, Kathy and Bill have got that kind of weird religious thing. You know. Um, yeah. Ike like girlfriends and sunbathing. Um, Elon. Doesn't like commercials, you know. Yeah. You know he sold the, the the houses, you know. He kind of he, he's more yeah. in it for the stimulation. I mean, they're, they're they're all different, but but yeah, play with leverage at, at at your peril, especially because hey, this. I mean, like, did you just say? <laughs> I mean, Elon et al are entertaining, but did you not just begin this conversation <laughs> by saying GDP in the first quarter fell in the United States of America, like? The hottest economy in the world. Did you just tell me it fell? Aren't we talking about the Federal Reserve, which is about to hike rates? Not baby baby Fed hike rates, but like 50 with the prompts to come again and again and again. Yeah. Hmm. That's... Oh, yeah. They're flexing. Mm. They're, they're, yeah. Yeah, 50. Damn right. Maybe 75 at one point. Yeah. Because the... Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, and know. the economy... Uh, the, the big drag was inventory. Yeah. I mean, this, this is the big, this is the big fear. Um, this is the big fear. You know, like, again, the, you know, we, we close, we, we did something that's never happened before. We don't have a data set. The data set is new. It's just emerging. You know, we closed down global industrial activity, not just industrial. We closed down commercial operations globally. For the best part of eighteen months, and indeed in, in the second largest economy in the world, it continues China, and then, and then at, when we reopened the biggest client market, the U.S., we we reopened the, the small, you know, the, the U.S. is a service sector economy, and when we sent those, not we, but when the government sent those uh, checks to the population to spend, you couldn't go and spend it on services because by and large they were still closed. You know, service consumption is still, like, by quite a major factor, below where it was in the year before COVID. It's like 2019, I think we're we're trending like maybe 15, 20 percent uh, below the absolute level. So you you put this ton of money, um, you can only spend it in this kind of very narrow uh, faucet, if you will. Um, and like the guys are still like trying to work it, remember the combination lock to reopen the factory. You know, they're still they're wiping the cobwebs. And it's like a tidal wave of orders come in from all these crazy Americans. And they're like, get, you know, so, you know, the market has to go, well, we're not ready for you. Like, so who needs it most? Let's find out. Let's raise prices. And then the Fed goes, whoa. Well, the, you know, the Fed goes, the Fed for the longest time, is sensible and it says, well, you know, we, we need more we need more data on this. But the politicians, of course, have got no time. They've got a you've got the American uh, elections, the midterm elections are fast approaching, and so the governing class are like, what do you mean you're you? What, what do you mean? You know, like you know, you, you're appointed to take actions. You know, get your finger out. You know, start doing something. And so here here we are in a world where uh, there is a presum a rational presumption that. Channels got massively overstocked. We now have again data point where the economy contracted 
because the inventory levels are like beyond absurd levels. Um, but now the Fed finds itself tied into a, a rate hike cycle. So. There are some who think that what we have now is, you know, an indication in the futures market and a lot of Fed talk, but that what will materialize is something much less aggressive by the time we even just get to the end of the year, maybe even the end of the end of the second quarter. Yeah. Um, I'd be in that camp. However, I worry about the damage done, okay, because I fear the Fed is a, a repeat offender. So I'm going to keep coming back to this notion that the global economy is in a depression. Um, the depression of the 1930s kind of gets exaggerated because we didn't have um, high-definition cameras and everything's a bit brown and pasty. And, of course, we had the, the coincidence of this, the, the profound right. meteorological events were, um, and the over-farming in, in, the Western, uh, Western, in, in the Midwestern states, which, you know, the Dust Bowl. Right? And so it really – but by and large, the 1930s statistically kind of look like the last 10, 12 years – People have got jobs, but they're not great jobs. And then there's this kind of coterie of people who are doing like absurdly well. Um, and we just never keep finding the gear. Why don't we find the gear? Because the damn feds keep getting in. The, the feds and the market, you know, so, you know, the, the 2009, the feds like, oh, you know, hey, look, you know, we, we, we just can't risk the Dep Great Depression too. So we're going to do quantitative easing. And so, then you have this profoundly poor academic and financial market response, which is panic and to say this is Weimar. Um, now, kind of, I can absolve part of that because it was it was new data, um, but you know that that then gave a green light to. I think you've got lots of buddies in mining and stuff that gave a green light to anyone in the extractive industries because all the all the seers were saying, "Hey, look, you know." We we've got to we, we want to own things in limited supply because the fiat currency is going to be infinitely expanded and that's the arbitrage opportunity. And between nine, ten, eleven, and of course at the same time you had China posing in commodities as well. So you had a massive capex boom in the extractive industries on top of what had happened or four or five or six or seven. Um, but the returns were catastrophic because we got to 2013 and, and the Fed then kind of went, Bernanke went, oh, oh, yeah, oh, I, I, th I think, oh, you know, George Bush on the aircraft carrier, hey, job done, you know. And I think it's time to take the punch bowl away. We're going to, we, we started doing quanti you know, quantitative tightening and then the capital markets took their lead from the Fed. They pushed 10-year rates well above three when adult unemployment was still seven and a half. We had a massive instant tightening of credit and all of that extractive industry investment just you got marked down to like 40 cents on the dollar. It was a waste of time. And all of the people responsible for it, yeah, were literally it wiped out. You know, they've all been replaced. And then on top of that, we've introduced, you know, the uh, save the planet and the, the nihilism of like extinction rebellion. No, no hydrocarbons. It's not like I can get it. No hydrocarbons maybe in 50, 60 years, but no hydrocarbons tomorrow. I mean, what are you people smoking? It's just a, it's stupid. It's, it's, um, you know, you're doing damage to, to real people. So let's do paradox. I want to say that owing to the Fed and it's, it's unsuccessful reading of the tea leaves. I want to say that the high prices we're seeing out of extractive industries from copper to oil um, to you name it, to iron ore. I think it's actually a function of the 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 the, what it, the malevolent shadow of the Federal Reserve just closing them down. You know, we were well on track, I think what, 2018, we were well on track to the US becoming the largest energy producer globally in the world. Um, it was being fun, you know, a lot of the um, the shale et al were being funded by credit. And then the, then the, the Fed went into it, the last kind of modest, short, abbreviated hiking cycle. And it led to all that high yield credit being wiped out. And so here we are now. And there's a, you know, to take, to take on the Russian offensive, we, we need the U.S. to be you know, the undistinct, um, undisputed, you know, global champion in, in, in energy. The oil, pr oil price has more than tripled from, its, from an exaggerated low. 
Um, and yet the executives are going, I, I ain't. I, I'm not, you know, like, because the, the capital providers, you know, the, the debt providers are on the phone every day. Like, Hank, I promise you, if you spend a dime expanding this business, you're out of here. You're out of Texas. I'm going to find you, my boys. We're going to drag you out. And it's like, hey, I get it. I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm paying dividends. I'm, I'm doing sh- share buybacks. That's the malevolence of the Federal Reserve. What we're talking about here is this is um, it's almost like a, a self-imposed discipline, you know, in the extractive industries, oil and gas mining, where, you know, their their DNA says, get a dollar of capital, dig a damn big hole in the ground and, you know, <laughs> let 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 the cards fall where they may. But they're not there's th- that devil may care attitude seems to be gone. And they have, if you will, learned what they've learned is not especially healthy for the long-term prosperity of us all. But what, what I want to know is, you know, when, when do they unlearn? What, what do we have to get $150 oil? Do we need like, you know, $10 copper or some crazy thing like that? Like where the hell is this going? And in the meantime, no matter what you think of, you know, CPI inflation, transitory, not whatever, it, it certainly feels that way to everybody buying stuff. You know, how, how does it end? Well, it's, it's very Orwellian. Yeah. You know, when you say they learned, they learned, like, you know, the, the goon squad have taken them to pieces. They, they, they say, okay, so raise your hand if you think that in the extractive industries, when we get a dollar, we, we dig a hole. And like the old guy's like, hey, hey over here, over here. Like, okay, boom, executed. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, I'm going to ask that question again. And the younger guys are going, <laughs> share my box. Good answer, you know. Hmm. Um, but where does it end? Yeah, but where does it end? It's, it's, it's ending. It, 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 it ends with the preposterous notion of uh, Russia invading Ukraine, okay? Um, Because the power card, the only power card that the Russians have has been the docile incompetence of European political leaders for the last 30 years, you know, in in accepting um, a supply commitment from the Russians, you know, so, and why did they do it? They did it because capital markets are saying, saying to their corporations, you know, that the, there are extractive industries listed on, on the European bourses and they've been, they've been warned not to, uh, you know, seek licenses and permits for discovery. Um, governments have been listening to the constitution of their, their voters and they've been, again, very hostile to any permit applications. You know, like Europe has got five years of sustainable energy, five years. You, European state is now failing. You, you fail as a state when you fail to provide an independent and robust energy supply. And, and like a state without energy is not a state. It's failed. It's failed at that point. So I think we're, we are close. So we, we did start uh, all a bit doom and gloom. Um, and life's not like that. You know, there, there, there are always opportunities uh, to make to make money um so the the education or whatever miseducation of the mining sector uh, actually turns the odds in in your favor as an external minority investor and um, because um taking away their reflexive behavior to expand supply with with higher prices simply means that higher prices are going to be with us longer and so they're going to keep rewarding you as an investor. So, you know, part of society is going to be on your ass saying like you're morally corrupt. It's them who are morally corrupt, but you know, uh, you've got to be able to, to take that on. But the returns from the extractive industry are, you know, are just glaringly, obviously attractive. And then there are some massive platforms tech wise, which got wrongly ascribed as being risk free. But that's fine because, you know, like a, 
price reduction kind of takes a lot of risk out of the equation. So, you know, there are things to be done. There are things to be done. And I think uh, we, we mentioned before the poster child of um, the situation in, in mining uh, possibly is Rio Tinto sporting a, albeit backward looking, 11% dividend yield, which lately represents something like 13 billion going forward. And we're saying, yeah. Yeah, it's a massive company and they would spend that much digging holes in the ground. And when they don't dig the holes, you could actually be looking at a double digit yield from a mining company. It's like, you know, South Africa, 1970s. I mean, it's just like we haven't seen this in a while. Pretty amazing. Well, um, I, I think it's maybe the price, maybe the, the, the stock prices are capped for the longest time. But heavens, the yield the yields is going to be very attractive. I mean, with what's happening, so, you know, so qualitatively, um, the big risk on businesses such as Rio's and Billiton is, you know, the, the dire, I mean, let's say, let's, let's call it a spade black. I mean, the dire state of the Chinese economy. That's been an enormous um, engine uh, in terms of guiding their, their profitability higher and higher and higher. Um, and, I mean, I've always been a skeptic. Um, I won't bore you with how, if I'd only understood the Chinese zodiac and how it works, it, it, it tracks the movement of heavenly bodies over 12 years and not 12 months. Um, I'd have saved myself grief, but now that I understand the Chinese zodiac, um, the stars align to tell me that the great correction, which you know, um, um, Kyle Bass like really trumpeted around about 2014, 2015, you know. I had a, I had about a billion and a half notional short fund um, in 2012. Um, we were too early. Like 2000, remember that number? 2000. I should. Was it 2000? I closed it in 2012. So it was 2000, 2010. At the end of 2010, I launched that. So I had 12 years on to 2010, and you are today, people. And you know that 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 damp that you know. Let's let's see let's see what happens to the currency. Um, um, and um, so yeah, so that may so you know, commercially that that that's going to be felt by those mining stocks, um, but but the but the you know, so volumes are going to I think going to be subject to some variance, but the the pricing is going to be the same if not higher. I think. No argument here, man. I own that stuff all day long. <laughs> you know, as the, the the circuit wiring of my head goes back into hedge fund mode. Um, you'd be very tempted to take a, a trace element of that dividend yield from Rio's and, and be buying uh, out of the money uh, forward um, uh, call options on on some of the on some of the metals. Um, but again, that's not you know we don't want to reward those who sell options because they get rewarded very well as it is. Um, I so let's say something smart. Um, Nothing goes up in a linear fashion. If it does, it's a fraud. Okay, um, and so plan for big drawdowns. So look at real tensors. I and I have. Um, I don't think there's a huge price downside risk in it per se. Uh, when I can try and decipher where a legitimate trend would would bottom out, I, I don't think is that. But I'm, I'm saying that um, buying dips in the mining sector. Um, doesn't seem like the dumbest thing that one could do. I mean, we need a strategy. Yeah. I mean, everyone listening to this is like, hey, yeah. and, and you're acknowledging, Hugh. Yeah. Are you not that the dips are substantial? Oh, yeah. But I don't think they're, I'm not talking about dips in the proportion that we're seeing in, in stocks mm -hmm. formerly thought of as being riskless. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, in terms of those majors, um, I'm, I'm talking about like 20% price corrections, not right. 50, 60% price corrections yeah that would make sense if if pricing in the in the commodities is continues to be strong right and actually have fun again with it have fun with, you know, so i'm just i'm i'm Do improvising it. as you speak but actually the out the ultimate fun with this thing is the paradox so so and it's a paradox born out of deception so the fed is 
doing nothing. It's it it's it has rhetoric which is to claim that it is printing money, and and to validate that it uses the reference of bank reserves, which it has been it's been accumulating via the or distributing rather to the banking sector via its accumulation of, of treasury purchases, but you know we're beginning to learn that that's nonsense. You 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 can't. Go to go try going to a bar tonight and ordering a beer and trying to pay for it with bank reserves, right? <laughs> They're going to get thrown out. It's not money, okay? They're not printing money, okay? And because they're not printing money, that's why, again, we find ourselves in a depression that the system needs some looseness of credit conditions, which the Fed is failing. And the Fed is failing because um, we pretty much, ever since the turn of the in my podcast this week, I try and reflect on this, but ever since the turn of the 20th century, you know, so the great, when America was China, you know, um, 1900 to, to 1930, we had this technological re- revolution in terms of, you know, being able, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the step forward in, in telegrams and the telephone where you could have correspondent banking across the states. And, and it led to, government money being replaced by by checks you know like people use checks to to buy things you, you know, up until that point it was, you know it was still specie it was still gold coins like you had to avoid sherwood forests because like there were bandits in there and they might steal your gold and give it to the the poor people you know but it was it was only a hundred years ago um and and that, that that totally changed but and, and it changed because the banks wanted the wanted the feds out of their out of their hair. These guys just always get it wrong. I mean, remember 1933, um, the, I don't know what, what the executive order is, but the one that banned households from owning gold, gold and silver species at, at home, that was thought of, that, that is just amazing because gold played no part in the propulsion to the, you know, these high stock market levels, which were regained for um, 25 years. It played no part in the devastation which befell the banking sector with the bankruptcy of almost every U.S. bank. Um, actually, that, that came more in the, the initial enthusiasm for this new new money called checks. And, and the banks like were smoking like too much. Like, yeah, yeah. They, they, they distributed it like confetti. Now, it, it produced amazing innovation. But it also produced amazing overvaluation, which when it corrected, of course, it created the depression. But to, to show you the lameness, and the, the Fed does not do good, it does bad. You know, they came out and, and, they, and they said, yeah, yeah, ban gold. That'll sort it out. It's like, you That's just right. revealed that you understand yeah. nothing. Yeah. Nothing. It was opportunistic, yeah, right? They didn't. They, they didn't yeah. want to let a crisis go Sorry, to waste. Sorry, that was a rant. Um, oh yeah, no. So, so forgive me. Um, yeah, but oh, but but you know. So let's be opportunistic. So actually, forgive me. We should edit all that out because cut to the chase. I think you should be owning ten-year, if not thirty-year U.S. securities, government bonds, alongside your. My package would be. I would own. I would own 30 year, 10 or 30 year, I don't care, right? Um, I would own, um, I'd, I'd own a bit of um, call, call options on way out of, like on um, zero Fed funds rates. Yeah? And I would own Rio Tinto. And I think there I'm really, really well covered. Because again, remember, the big issue for you trying to, you know, talk down the, the, the dividend yield from Rio's is that, that China really just, you know, like really falls over. And if it really falls over, like the 10 year yielding three is going to change. I mean, if I was running the world, I would actually put a surcharge on, on, on 10 year treasuries for uh, all these sovereign wealth funds that park their money in U.S. treasuries. I would charge them yeah. for the privilege. Believe me, they would for pay For the same reason that people held... That's cool. Maybe That's I'm sorry, cool. I'm just waking up. No, the for the same reason that people in. are holding like <sighs> negative yielding. Yeah, yeah, they would pay it. Sure. Um, <clears throat> and that's a, I've talked about this a little bit with our listeners. You know, it's what I call true diversification. You know, you, it's hard, is it not, 
and I know you've expounded on this frequently over the years, you kind of specialized, one might say, it's hard not to be correlated. And that, that may be one, like one of your, if not your greatest achievement at Eclectico, right? I mean, it's hard not to be correlated. And, and if you can do it simply, if you can buy Rio in 10s and 30s and call it good, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, we don't always get to do that. Well, that was my setup, and, and, and thank you for identifying that, because um, whatever, you know, he, I'm in St. Bart's, and I'm, I'm certainly not playing for a violin, um, I'm playing my softboard. Um, but, um, yeah, the, you know, I, for 15 years, I ran um, a macro fund that correlated with, with nothing, neither, neither my peer group, um, the dollar, gold, equities, treasuries. Now, um, uh, there wasn't a moment where I did not target a correlation to a particular asset class, but that, that changed over time, if you will. And when you looked at that thing, um, as you say, it, it is the heart. You know, there's a, the, the, the huge hope and expectation for Bitcoin. Um, or I could put it the other way around, the huge lie embedded in Bitcoin. Take it, whatever, whatever, your, whatever your prejudice lies, I'm right at the apex and I'm watching. Okay, um, I don't. I you know to have to to, um, to try and eliminate correlations. You've got to eliminate prejudice. Okay, so I'm at the apex. Um, but for Bitcoin to grow into the bull market that the many believe it's going to continue to enjoy, it has to resolve the correlation issue. It's, it's, it's got a correlation of one to Kathy Woods. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but it's got a correlation of one to NASDAQ. Uh, now, that's not to, to do it down. I'm saying if you're heavily invested in it, your biggest, the biggest risk that you're underwriting just now is that correlation. For it to be validated, you need a profound correlation switch. I don't know how we... I, it's possible, but for this moment in time, I don't have the brain bandwidth to, to determine or describe to you the set of circumstances where where it goes to zero correlation. No, uh, but we did have a guest, uh, Mike McGlone from Bloomberg, and he said 2022 is the year. This is the year that Bitcoin ceases to be this you know, risk on... NASDAQ, I mean, I, I say it trades like a freaking biotech stock, whatever you want to call it, um, and, and starts becoming this risk-off asset that everyone claims that it is, but has yet to you know, reveal itself as. So this is it, man. <laughs> this is the moment. He's, he's got to do, you know, um, in fairness to your listeners, um, they, they deserve more than just a day. You, you go, oh, okay, this year because what happens? To talk me through it. Don't just make a, you know, like, as a, as, a, as a statement, it's a preposterous statement. Come into my hedge fund office and, and that that's all you got? Okay, okay, pal, time to leave, you know. Um, so I'm trying to, let's, let's if you got your calculator, because there's too many zeros, so um, 200 thousand metric tons of gold seems to be the the median guesstimate of how much gold has ever been mined yeah 200,000 and there are 32,000 oh my god yeah 32,000 uh, ounces in a metric ton okay so that is six six spot four to the power of nine I've no idea what that means I think that means um I have no idea what that means. Um, and then multiply it by, let's use 2,000 bucks because it's just a round figure for the price of an ounce of gold. Okay. And that takes us to one spot, 28 to the power of 13. That takes us to um, essentially 13. The value of all the gold mined in the world at $2,000 is uh, $13 trillion. Um, and the the Bitcoin argument is that um, as it grows into itself, um, that Bitcoin, and indeed it is, it, it's displacing gold, and therefore um, 
if no one seeks the, the sanctuary of gold anymore and they seek it for Bitcoin, then Bitcoin has to be a $13 trillion asset. So um, the, the checking account introduced by the US banking sector with correspondence banking at the turn of the 20th century effectively took government it took governments out of money and and a hundred years later with the technology of the the world wide web um, we're recreating the, the the checking correspondence network via the blockchain and the ultimate goal for that is to take the banking sector out of money and that's interesting imagine taking the banking sector out of money that's when it gets. That's when it gets right. so jazzy. It's maybe worth holding holding a little Bitcoin as an option on all this, right? It's, you you don't even have to hold much of it if that's the potential. Indeed, you're right. When you're talking about something that might make 15, 20 times, um, I mean that itself is telling you that you should have a you know, you should bet the house on you should, but you should have something in it. You know. So for me, I in this environment. So I, so again, let's extend that notional portfolio. We've got treasuries. Uh, we're buying a bit of end of the world uh, um, f- uh, fat tail, like the Fed goes to goes negative on on rates. Why not? We're not going to spend much, fifteen basis points. <laughs> um, we are. Uh, we're, what did you say? The dividend yield was 13, 13.5 from Rio's. Uh, well, eleven percent equates to something like thirteen billion dollars. Eleven. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, forgive me. Okay, so yeah. about eleven percent. Hey, let me call it ten percent. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, um, we'll take some of that, um, and we'll, you know, whatever we have in 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 billetin, I would have maybe twenty percent of my billetin holding in in Bitcoin, and and I'd, I'd still have a bit in gold because technically, you know, breaking two thousand just feels like you go three thousand very quickly. Why not? It, again, it, it's a kind of circular hedge, making your portfolio more robust. Um, and then you got to have some uranium. Come on. Um, yeah. we, we've all got mining friends. We understand mining. you got to have a bit of uranium as well. Got and it. you know what? Boom. You know. And then you're on the beach at St. Bart's. <laughs> and you're good. Well, Hugh, we, we've been actually talking for, for quite a while. And um, I'm really glad that we could do it. I have a final question that I ask all my guests. Regardless of topic, and you can go anywhere with the answer that you'd like, but it's the same question, same final question for every guest, no matter what. And that is, if you, if I, if I said you must leave our listener with a single thought today, what would it be? Um, I, I, I thought I, I as think, much. I think yeah. I've done that. I don't. I don't think I can. Um, I can exceed the notion that. Yeah, I think we're, you know, the, the, the thought bubble is we're on the verge of taking banks out of money. Okay, we're in a de- depressions. The financial media are banned. I, it would seem, you know, it, we discovered during COVID that there were things that you could say in printed media and things that you could not say. We weren't aware of that before. And, and, and therefore, I want to say that the, the sh- I mean, you do not see the word depression yeah. in financial publications. Okay, it, it's as if it's being banned. Now, depressions, thankfully, are very f- few and far between. You know, le, le, le Miserable, the the kind of I was going to call it opera. That's a musical. The the you know, the Victor Hugo uh, opera was talking about the first incidents of depression mm. around about 1830 to 1850. Um, and and it's, it's a general condition, it's, it's a general malaise, general economic malaise felt by the ordinary Joe. And for the first time, it wasn't a function of the corrupt kleptocracy, the king invading Russia or what have you. It was a mysterious force unknown to civilization at that point, which is to mm. say it was the banking sector reigning in credit. Okay. Uh, we had the second run about 1870 to 1900. We had the third 1930 to kind of, you know, to into the second world war. Um, and now we've got the fourth, we've got the fourth, you know, from 2008 until like an unknown date. Um, and they've always, we've always been, uh, Capitalism is with us. Market-based capitalism is with us, has endured because there has been a financial innovation 
um, which has resolved uh, the money question, money being too tight. And so the thought bubble is here we are in this fourth major period that I call the depression, fourth in 200 years, and, and perhaps we will exit it, which is to say we will regain previously higher levels of GDP growth um, with the advent of a new monetary order, which removes, so having removed sovereigns and governments from the, the money process, I mean, that's called the euro dollar system. Euro dollar is a private banking system. It has no governments. This is why the Fed is blind. Um, the next step now, because the banks have made such a hash of the euro dollar system, that the banks need to be replaced and they need to be replaced by, you know, I don't need bozos in my French bank. You know, I don't have to sign 1,673 pages of documents. I've got a blockchain. I get my fingerprint, boom, and money gets transferred and commerce operates. It's another ledger system. So, I mean, hey, that's the, that's the best thought you can be left with people. To, let's take banking out of money. Awesome. Come on, you know, let's enjoy the weekend. I look forward to it. <laughs> I'm glad, happy to participate in it. Listen, thanks, you man. I, I really appreciate you doing this with us. Um, hmm. I I have to say that I am interested in hearing what you say about these things, almost more than any other guest. I mean, you're you're a true maverick, and and thanks for coming on and talking with us. Well, that's very kind of you. Uh, thank you. So, guys, look, listen. I know that when we have Hugh on, he's going to be a little harder to follow than most of our guests. And he knows that too about himself, but he is what he is. And I just think that he's a true maverick. He, he really has a way of looking at things that is unlike any other. And I alluded to it during the interview. It's because, you know, he ran this fund for so many years that wasn't correlated to anything. And that's how he sees the world. And you heard us talk about a hypothetical portfolio, Rio Tinto, 10 and 30 year treasuries, maybe some gold, putting a little bit of your dividends from like Rio Tinto or BHP bills into, into a little bit of Bitcoin or something. I just want you to listen to the thought process that gets you a hypothetical portfolio that is probably not going to correlate with anything and could do really, really well, right? And all the historical information and the insight and just Hugh's passion, come on, there's nobody like him. So, you know, I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I love talking to the guy. And All right, that was fun. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it right now. Last year, when most investors were watching their stocks plummet, one Wall Street legend had an unfair advantage that was identifying winning stocks with massive upside, like Riot Blockchain before it shot up 10,090% in less than 12 months, Digital Turbine before it shot up 789% in eight months, Overstock.com before it shot up 1,050% in four months and more. Clients have paid as much as $5,000 per month to see this kind of research. But today, you can get a glimpse at his system, the Power Gauge, absolutely free. It's a new way to see which small stocks could soon be rated a buy across Wall Street and shoot up. By using a secret so powerful, CNBC's Jim Cramer said, even he doesn't want to bet against it. This Power Gauge comes from the legendary Mark Chaikin. Mark is the creator of one of Wall Street's most popular indicators, a system that appears on every Bloomberg terminal in the world, and it's used by banks, hedge funds, and every major brokerage site. He spent 50 years on Wall Street, survived and thrived in nine bear markets, nine, built three new indices for the NASDAQ where he once rang the opening bell, but today, Mark has turned his back on Wall Street and wants to show you how this unfair advantage works. Right now, you can get a free in-depth look at how his power gauge system works, a way to type in any of 4,000 different ticker symbols and see exactly where the stock is most likely to go next and in any type of market. Simply go to www.trypowergauge.com for your free look. 
Again, that's www.trypowergauge.com. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Send questions, comments, and politely worded criticisms, please, to feedback at investorhour.com. I read as many emails as time allows and respond to as many as possible. You can also call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. First up this week is Anthony H. Great question, Anthony. I love you for this question. He says, Dan, why are the government and Federal Reserve officials always pushing the need for inflation? Many Fed officials have stated the biggest threat to the economy is low inflation. Wouldn't standard of living and consumer spending go up with less inflation? Is it some kind of conspiracy, Anthony H.? Well, Anthony, I don't know if it's a conspiracy, but it sort of comes off like one, right? It's a de facto conspiracy because you are absolutely right. There is inflation is bad. If there's 2% inflation, which, you know, a long time Federal Reserve target, we want to have 2% inflation. Um, that's, that's still bad. You know, over time, you're still inflating away the power of your savings and your wages. And, and you are stoking the fires of speculation as well, aren't you? Because the more your money gets eaten away, the less you can put it in a bank and save it up. So you have to speculate to get a return on it. And, and I, you're quite right. The standard of living and consumer spending would both go up with, you know, no inflation less or no inflation. And, you know, they make up stories about why they think we need a little bit of inflation, why that's good. But I think the truth of the matter is they're just trying to keep asset prices propped up. And that's all there is to it, right? They're trying to keep real estate and, you know, stocks and, and, commodities and whatever else, just asset prices in general, they're trying to keep them propped up and looking good over time. And they have this belief too, all these people studied economics in college, which ruined their brains. And they have this belief that deflation is, is the most horrible thing that could ever happen because of the great depression, right? Ben Bernanke, you know, he made his academic bones saying this. And so you know, he unleashed quantitative easing and, and here we are many years later living with the living with the effects of that kind of thinking. So yeah, I agree. It's it's ridiculous and it's really harmful. Great question, Anthony. It should be asked frequently. Next up is Troy R. Troy says, I have practiced emergency medicine since nineteen ninety six, and one of my mentors used to say the more I do this, the less I know. It took me a long time to understand that, but I truly get it now. My question for you is, do you ever feel the same about finance? Keep up the great work and look forward to the next episode, Troy R. Yeah, I feel that way. I don't necessarily feel that way about um, analyzing the fundamentals of businesses. I feel that my knowledge has truly compounded in that area over time. And I think it can. But when it comes to markets, whoa, I mean, it's an, it's an understatement to say the more I do, the less I know. The more I do, the more I watch the way markets behave, um, you know, the more I realize I don't know anything about it. That's why I finally, you know, I just started saying, I don't make predictions, prepare, don't predict. That's the best we can do. I think it's the best we can do consistently. Every now and then you get a prediction right. It makes you feel like you're smart, but you're really, you know, you're fooled by randomness. You're just lucky in those instances. So, yeah, the more, the more I do this, the more I watch the way markets behave, um, the more I realize I just don't know anything about it. Thank you, Troy. It's, again, that's the type of question that should be asked repeatedly, regularly. Next up is Jeff K. And he says, Mr. Ferris, Russia has been hoarding gold for close to a decade. They start selling it off in order to raise money to mitigate the numerous economic sanctions against them. Won't that cause the price of gold to plunge? Sincerely, Jeff K. 
Uh, it could. It could. You want, you know, I don't know. I mean, temporarily, permanently, you know, which, which of those two? I, I would guess temporarily, if at all, um, because I think we're coming into a time when gold and silver have become more desirable and will continue to be more desirable over the next, you know, five, ten years-ish. Um, so I, I think it could happen, you know, any big seller entering a market that is, let's face it, pretty small compared to stock and bond and currency markets, any big seller can have an effect on the market, but it's whether or not it's permanent. And, you know, will other central banks and other countries start selling? Uh, I don't know. I doubt it. Um, I, I think they all want to hold gold now. So yes, I don't think it would my answer is yes, but I don't think it would be permanent. Okay, next, Matt O wrote in, and he's going to give me a chance to clarify. Now, before I, I, I probably won't read Matt's whole question. Um, he, he's writing in about something that I said when we were interviewing Patrick Yip, and I made it sound like um, using one gold's uh, accounts to buy gold and silver was a way to get around. I, I forget the term I used, but, um, you know, Matt said, yeah, Matt said it does not any way. It's not a way to get around the spot to physical premium. Right. So I said, I made it sound like you were getting around the, the need to pay an enormous premium on silver coins by having a one gold account. Well, that's not true because one gold doesn't buy coins. Right. And this is my my wife says that I always start thoughts in the middle and don't complete them. So <laughs> maybe we can chalk it up to that. But Matt, you're absolutely right. Having a one gold account does not mean you can buy coins at no premium. The coins are still at an enormous premium, silver coins. It just means you can buy silver bullion and buying silver bullion, no matter where you buy it. Um, has a much smaller, like a normal 2% kind of premium, as you point out in your email. So I just want everybody to know that I, I didn't mean to suggest that, you know, the folks at Apmex who also run One Gold um, have some secret way of getting around the enormous premium on silver coins or that buying you know, silver bullion was some secret way to get around. No, not at all. You're absolutely right, Matt. Not at all. Right. Silver coins have huge premiums right now. The way to not pay that premium and still own silver is the point, right? Is to buy regular silver bullion, you know, like bullion bars. And you can buy them, um, you know, in fractional amounts effectively with, you know, a small amount of money by having a one gold account. That was the point. So Matt, thank you for giving me a chance to clarify. I appreciate it. And I'm glad you wrote in. Next, I have two questions from our longtime listener and frequent correspondent, Lodovic H. Um, Lodovic, wow, you really loaded up my email this, <laughs> this week. Uh, you must have written, you know, eight or nine of them. But I, I have these two. Um, and the first one is, Hi, Dan. Something to think about. In what way, I think you meant to say, in what way is Russia different? What is Putin doing differently? All governments kill. All governments steal by taxation. All governments just take what they wish and don't compensate you. And then he's talking about in the Netherlands, they're, they're talking about confiscating farmland um, and real estate being confiscated for refugee shelters. Uh, so Lodovic, yeah, you know, I agree with you. I agree completely. All governments do what Putin does. They're, that's I, I frequently say they're all the same. I'm usually referring to conservatives and liberals or so-called progressives, whatever, in the United States. Um, but governments are governments. They're all, all governments seek to have a monopoly on violence in a given geographical region, and, and they use it to take whatever they want. Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. And if there was no invasion of Ukraine, the headlines about Ukraine would still be that it's one of the worst governments in Europe. You're, you're, you're absolutely right to ask that question. It doesn't get asked enough, you know. And finally, from Lodovic this week, um, he says, regarding your 60th birthday, I turned 60 last November and talked about it a little bit. 
Regarding your 60th birthday, what are the big lessons in life? Can you do an episode on it? <laughs> well, Lodovic, thank you for having the confidence that, you know, that I might actually get a whole episode out of my 60th birthday, but no, it's just not that important. And and it's not so much big lessons in life as things I've changed about my perspective. Um, if there was a big lesson in my life so far, it's understanding um, via negativa, right? Via negativa, as Nassim Taleb put it, he said, you know, the learning of life is about what to avoid. In any situation, figure out what to avoid and look for what's not being said and what's not being shown and what's not there and what is, you know, what is not. What, what, what is there is obvious, right? You can see, you can hear what the government wants you to hear. They, you know, they'll keep saying that all day long, but think about what they're not saying and what they don't want you to hear, for example. And in, a, in an investment, you know, if you're looking at a public company, you can read what's there. You know, you can read what's written in the reports, but what's not in the reports? What are they not telling you? Ask those questions. They are very, very important. So the big lesson in my life has been via negativa. The big change in my perspective as a result of turning 60 has been um, that I, I just, I think I've gotten a little crotchety or something, and I just do what I want to do um, without worrying about who's offended by it. And I think um, also, we touched on this when we talked with Brent Cook a few episodes back, I have taken to... Um, it's just a more natural thing for me to to ask in any given moment, am I enjoying what I'm doing? And, you know, with the podcast, it's like, yes, 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 all day long. It's like the favorite part, my favorite part of the week. Um, that and writing the Stansberry Digest, I am loving that to death. So I get to do both of those things every week. Um, and that's great. Um, so, you know, if I don't enjoy something, like how can I either get rid of it or minimize it or, I don't know, change my attitude about it or what do I enjoy about it? You know, my enjoyment of things and what I what I like and love and want to do is much more a guiding force to me than, you know, some ambition about making money or something like that. Thank you for asking, Lodovic. I appreciate it. Well, that's another mailbag, and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com, click on the episode you want, scroll all the way down, click on the word transcript, and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody else who might like it, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at investorhour.com. And do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want me to interview? Drop us a note, feedback at InvestorHour.com. Or call the listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email. Feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansbury Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. 
Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.